Hey, thank you very much. Thanks for that generous introduction. And by the way, Amanda deserves an award herself. She's come, she's been to um, three, this is her fourth time she's heard this talk, so <laughs> she should, uh, one, once in Abu Dhabi, once in Bergen, and once in the US. So um, <laughs> she has real fortitude to, be, <laughs> to stick through another version of this. Um, anyway, um, okay. So thank you very much for coming. and. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here in, at Vanderbilt. And the book that, the, 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 this talk, as Amanda mentioned, is based on this book that, that came out in, um, a year ago. So when I went to Uganda in 1992 to carry out research, uh, I was interested in why Uganda, which had just come out of years of major conflict, had so many women in top government positions, and why the country had the highest rate of representation of women in parliament at the time. Um, what I did not know then, and what we know now, is that it was the beginning of a whole pattern of countries coming out of major conflict and then finding large numbers of women in um, legislative seats, um, but also at the cabinet level and, and, even and even in the executive. And these countries were also making more um, changes in terms of women's rights reforms in their constitutions and legislation when you compared them with non-post-conflict countries. But I knew none of that when I first went to Uganda. I was just curious, you know, why this country? Why Uganda out of all these, all other African, uh, the other 52 African countries? Why was it so different? 
And, um, and so it was really, in fact, the beginning of this, this trend of, of um, post-conflict countries um, showing these, these, um, these, this pattern of women um, making advances, at least in the formal uh, realm. And so you had about, 50, depending on how you counted, about 15 other countries that came out of conflict where you saw this pattern emerging. Uh, and this was the, uh, at the time, in the early 90s, the, the, the head of vice president who was a woman um, for 10 years. So the questions that I'm, I ask in this, pro, in this book um, and in this talk are why, what accounts for this curious byproduct of war um, that has resulted in the higher political leadership rates for women and more, more constitutional and legislative changes re regarding women's rights in post-conflict countries. How were post-conflict countries able in a very short period of time to advance women's status in key areas, and so, in fact, in some, sometimes the most challenging areas for women? Um, and in terms of political representation, they um, accomplished what the Nordic countries had done um, over a period of 100 years. Many of these countries did it literally overnight, um, Rwanda perhaps being the most striking example of this, where um, you had uh, a jump from 17% prior to the genocide to, a, to what we see, 60, 64% more recently, 61, I think it went down again, but it's 60, 61% today. So a huge, you know, huge increases in representation. Um, so the project that this book is based on is, um, it looks at three countries primarily, uh, Uganda, Liberia, and Angola. Angola being the country where the, you see some of these patterns, but not to the same degree as Uganda and Liberia. I also did work in Kenya and um, Democratic Republic of Congo. And so there's these, these are the in-depth case studies, but then it's against um, across national um, studies and in, in including um, uh, a statistical work. So in, the, in these three countries, um, my research strategy was much the same. I interviewed hundreds of members of parliament, um, leaders of women's rights organizations, human rights organizations, um, people in the ministries, party leaders, policy makers, opinion leaders, journalists, academics, and so on, donors as well. Um, and then, um, and then, this, then the study draws on, but doesn't go into a, a, a journal article that I did with Melanie Hughes that shows the same pattern, but statistically, through cross-national quantitative um, longitudinal um, study using latent growth curve analysis, where you can see, you know, in one of our charts, the countries that are post-conflict, the darker line, um, the rates of increase of women in national legislature are much higher and greater and fast, going much faster than the countries that, um, that are not, um, that were not post-conflict. Now I think that, that you know, these other countries are catching up, but for a long time you saw this, this, um, this trend and it, um, emerging. Um, and it was also not just countries that were post-conflict, but countries where you had major conflict, conflict of high intensity conflicts that were long in duration. So um, high rates of death and long in duration, um, these seem to have the, the, the sharpest effects in terms of women's representation. So what accounts for these trends? Well, I'm gonna lay the argument out, but just in a nutshell, I think it has to do with disruptions that take place in gender relations during conflict. Uh, and um, so that's not enough because you have also conflicts that do not result in these same kinds of changes in women's status. So timing is critical. Um, you also need to have women's movements that emerged um, at the same time to push some of these changes. And then you have um, changes in inter international norms regarding women's rights, which explains why you see these changes mostly after 1990s, but especially after 2000 um, and not earlier. So you didn't see it after 1975, the ends of the wars in Mozambique, Angola, Guinea-Bissau. You didn't see it at that time. You, saw, um, you didn't even see it in Zimbabwe after 1980. It's really only in this later um, in these later, in the most recent years, that you, you see this pattern. Okay, then there's some arguments that I don't give as much credence to. Um, one you hear is that there was this backlash that takes place after wars, and that that um, after war, um, women are told to go back to the kitchen, basically, and and that even if they participated in, say, a, a liberation movement, that they don't make gains. Um, I think that that was true. I think it was true for the earlier period. In Algeria, for example, you had 11,000 women that fought you know, on the front lines with the men 
for independence for Algeria. And then when Algeria became independent, they were literally told to go back to the, 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 the kitchen and they did not benefit in any way from all of the, they had thought that their contributions to the war for independence would give them something and it in fact nothing nothing changed and things in fact got worse but things did change after the black decade the, the second um, conflict in Algeria from, from uh, 1992 to 2002 after that you did see changes so the timing is very important so I don't and if you look at the countries like Uganda or Liberia there was not a backlash against the women. In fact, uh, the, at the, there's one, for example, one study done in Liberia of, uh, by Kindvetter of um, media accounts of women's rights organizations, and they were overwhelmingly positive, um, much more positive than negative, and, they, and, and especially at the height of the movement in 2006. Um, another argument is that um, women gained power because the men died. <laughs> and uh, the men just weren't around, and, it, and so the, there's, a, there's an argument to be made around the sex ratio. Um, one of the ar countries where this argument is often made is with res regard to Rwanda, uh, where people throw around numbers like 70% um, of the population were women after the genocide in 1994, or 80% sometimes. This figure I cannot find, there's no particular origin for it, it doesn't come from anything, it's just been kind of thrown out there and used very loosely in the literature. Um, there was a, if you look at more careful studies of the demographic changes, there was a 0.1, the very largest change was 0.1% um, percent in Rwanda. Uh, and there was a, a, a change in the sex ratio. Um, and perhaps the largest, at one point, there was a 0.4% change. And it is true that at the local level, I think that there were, you know, men had gone, fled the country, were, in det were being detained, they had, um, they were displaced internally. So maybe, you know, in that, that those early years, there's a lot of, there are a lot of accounts of how women played a major role in the household. But it cannot explain a jump, you know, this jump that I just mentioned from 17% to 64%. It just cannot, this 0.1% difference cannot explain that kind of a jump. And the pool of women was, was still, was always there. Moreover, if the absence of men would have that kind of impact on representation, you would expect to see similar outcomes in Botswana or Lesotho, places where you've had large migrant, migration of men out of the society um, into to South Africa and to, to for purposes of employment, and we don't see that kind of effect. So it's unlikely that, that um, the absence of men has that kind of inf impact. And then... Um, Finally, there's an argument that, that, that what you see, what you might see are changes in um, gender roles, but not gender relations. Uh, and what I would argue is that no, it's actually more than just a few changes in roles. You, you see, I mean, that happens, but you also see a normative change go, taking place in society and, and changes in ideologies and governments for whatever their purposes are. Um, using, we can talk about what those purposes might be, um, using women's rights as a way to redefine the polity and, and to make statements about um, you know, where they think the society should be at uh, in terms of women's rights. And so um, and many of these are very, you know, just are aspirational, but they are a change. It's not something that's just the rep repetition of the past. It is a change in terms of what the expectations are for women's rights. Um, so these are some of the arguments that I'm not so um, keen <laughs> to, to use in, in, in explaining what happened. Um, what ha in addition to the arguments that I put forward having to do with the disruption and the role of women's movement and international norms, um, there's also some conditions, I think, that have to be in play to, to result in these, these outcomes. And one is that um, these are temporally defined, so it wasn't... Um, it was mostly after the 1990s and especially after 2000. These are not, these are not earlier, uh, this phenomena we did not see earlier. And that has to do with the changes internationally. For example, the UN Conference on Women in Beijing in 1995, where you saw a uh, uh, platform of action that stipulated that all member states should take some effort, to, uh, take some steps to increase women's leadership roles in their countries at all levels. Also, um, we're talking about major wars here. Uh, these are not little, um, you know, um, smaller wars. Uh, these are not um, 
uh, yeah, it, it, these, are, these have to be wars that really create ruptures in society. And so that's why it has to be, these are long wars, these are deadly wars, um, war, wars that cause a major reordering of society at their end. Um, these are not, um, these are generally civil wars um, or national liberation wars. Um, where you saw greater possibilities for changing women's rights, but not so much localized conflicts. So, for example, after the conflict in northern Uganda, uh, which ended around 2006, depending on where you draw the line, um, and started around 1987, um, that, was one, that was localized conf conflict. And so it didn't have the same impact in terms of changing the constitution and changing laws. Same thing with the Kazaman struggle in Senegal. Uh, so localized conflict doesn't have the same outcomes, nor does uh, international conflict. So these, because, and, and the reason is that these um, conflicts have to result at the end of the day in some kind of a restructuring of society, and neither of these two kinds of conflicts, localized or international, necessarily result in something, an, an agreement or a, uh, a, a peace resolution within the country. And so you can see this quite graphically with the, the blue line of the past major conflicts. So con countries that had major conflicts, you can see the levels of representation of women in parliament. Compared to the red line, countries with no conflict, um, the green line, limited conflict, very, very sm you know, regionalized conflict, but just based in one small area. And then the blue purple line being ongoing conflict. So all these other, these no conflict, limited conflict, and ongoing conflict do not have the same outcomes as the um, past major conflict. Uh, and then you have um, the way the war end matters. Um, and so, the, well, the, no, sorry, the war has to have ended. That was the other point. The war has to have ended. It can't be ongoing. So this is why you don't see the same patterns as clearly, although there's some elements of these patterns in, say, um, Democratic Republic of Congo or in Somalia. I mean, you see some elements, but not, not to the full extent that you would in a country where you've had time for, for legislative change to really kick in. Um, and then the way the war ends uh, matters as well. And that's the, that there has to be some kind of negotiated settlement. Um, there has to be some coming together um, of, the, of the contending parties. Uh, usually in the form of a comprehensive peace agreement, which then paves the way for constitutional reform, which then paves the way for legislative reform. So in a country like Angola, or, and, and by the way, this is not an Africa phenomenon. The reason why I'm we're talking about Africa is because Africa saw them, had the most conflicts, and it had the most conflicts that came to an end. But you see the same pattern in Nepal and East Timor and other countries at the, during the, where conflict ended in the same per time period. So in... So in Sri Lanka, for example, or in Angola, the way the conflict ended was one side completely decimated the other, or, or defeated the other, um, vanquished the other side. And so there wasn't a peace agreement, there wasn't, there wasn't any, no negotiation of a new constitution or a new arrangement. Uh, it was just one side won, and that was the end of it. So where you, where you have that, you don't have a real reason to change, to keep, um, to really um, grapple with creating a new polity. Uh, and then finally, um, there was this, there's an argument that women's perceived um, the perception of women as new actors that were untainted by conflict um, gives them an added appeal to voters. Uh, and so, in, even if the reality was quite far from it, so in, in Liberia and Sierra Leone, about 20% of the fighters were women, maybe even 30%. Um, and in Liberia, the, um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who became president of the country, had admitted to initially funding Charles Taylor and his invasion into Liberia to overthrow the government. So it's not like women haven't played a part in these conflicts, but certainly to a lesser degree and, and you know, not as active, and, and, and they were often the leaders of peace movements. So there's a very strong perception in most countries that they're not they were not the cause of the conflict, that they're not um, uh, to blame in the same way that men were. And so that also gives them kind of a, a moral, um, an added moral advantage when it comes to, to politics. I should also point out that in making these claims that I'm making, this is just an observation of a 
a byproduct of conflict. I'm not advocating for conflict as a means of obtaining women's rights. I mean, that should go without saying, but I don't want people to confuse me. I'm not, this, I'm not promoting war or conflict as a means of, of resolving issues, obviously. This, that, nobody in the right mind would do that. Um, so, just, just having made all these caveats, there is one, you know, and I've talked about the temporality of these, but there are some other parallels in history, one of which was World War I, when you had had um, women in World War, War I um, fighting for, I mean, they had been involved in uh, the war as nurses, as munitions workers, as soldiers, as doctors, as drivers of buses and ambulances. Um, and many women who worked in, in, in these uh, fields got the same level of pay as men had earned, and that was something that was a big change. And you also saw changes in the traditional gender structures collapsing, um, and sexual mores changed, changed at the time in a, in a profound way. At the same time, women had been pressing for the right to vote in, in Europe and in the U.S., um, and in fact, you know, Britain, Germany, Austria, and in the U.S., they had been pushing for this for 70 years, and nothing had happened. And then all of a sudden, World War I, and and then after that, even President President Woodrow Wilson, who had not supported women's right to vote, after the war, said that if we're going to if we were going to be a democracy, women have to be able to vote. And so he changed his stance and and. Um, uh, supported the, the right to vote. So again, you, ha you have the same kind of expansion of, you know, very many of the same patterns here, the expansion of women's rights in a very dramatic way at, the, at, the ti at that time. And you have it, you know, w women's movements involved in pressing for these changes. You have an international movement that's pressing for these changes in norms around women's right to, to um, equal represent, equal, to, to participate in politics equally to men. Okay, so what have we seen? What's the evidence for this? Well, if you look at the majority of countries that have high, the highest rates of representation of women in legislatures in Africa, um, they're all, almost all, except for Senegal and Tanzania, they're all post-conflict countries. And uh, just so we know, that we know where we stand in terms of the United States, we have, um, you know, 61% women in the parliament in Rwanda, we have 20% in the US, right? So we're not even on that chart there. <laughs> um, and here again, you can see why quite clearly the countries that are post-conflict have, on average, um, twice as many women in parliament as countries that haven't gone through conflict. And when I started the study, there was, it was three times as high. Now it's, you know, the, the gap is narrowing, but it's still, you can see the pattern quite clearly. Um, the, uh, and the reason for this is the use of quotas. So these are measures that are taken that um, increase the possibility for women to, for women candidates to um, be uh, elected. And sometimes these are in the form of legislation that requires all parties to take certain measures that would increase the possibility of women um, being elected. Sometimes you have reserved seats where seats are set aside that only women can run for. Sometimes, usually it's like a 30% um, quota. Um, and sometimes parties themselves will take steps to enhance the possibility of um, women uh, um, uh, getting elected. And so you can see the difference between post-conflict countries, countries with no major conflict, and countries that have ongoing. You can see the, the difference in terms of, of um, the levels of representation. So you have the change in legislatures. You also have, you know, we haven't had many African women presidents, but we've had a few. And it, I don't think it's an accident that the very first one was in Liberia. Liberia was a country that had had quite a few women already in positions, in positions of um, in superintendents of counties. They had been on the Supreme Court. They had been um, quite a few secretaries um, of ministries. And uh, even in 1996, Ellen Perry, um, who died a couple years ago, she was the f elected to, as the head of the transitional government at the time, in the middle of the, the war. And uh, so it wasn't, this was nothing new to them, but I don't think it's an accident that you, know, you had a woman coming out of the, the, the conflict in Liberia, you had a woman that was elected um, in 2006, and then she won re-election. And just recently, now, uh, what, two months ago, she stepped down and, and Weah took over. Uh, same thing in the middle of the conflict in Central African Republic, uh, they, uh, in, the, in uh, 2014, 
they selected Catherine Samba Panza, who was a human rights lawyer. She'd been very active in civil society. And there was the sense that you know, she wasn't on either side of the conflict. She was not attached to any particular um, group and that she would be neutral. And so they brought her in as the interim president um, of that country. You've had, uh, if you look, just do the math on these, the, the, the numbers of, uh, proportionately, the numbers of um, speakers of the House have been more in these post-conflict countries in Africa. The same thing goes for prime ministers. They haven't been many, but, but you know, of the ones that have been there. Um, ministers, uh, the same thing. Um, you have had ministers. She was there only a short time, Antoinette Saya, because she got then seconded to the um, International Monetary Fund and directed the Africa desk there and just recently stepped down from that position. Um, but even in the executive, just to go back to the executive again, since we're on the page of ministers, you had, I, I should have mentioned that prior to 2000, only nine women had run for presidential office in Africa. But from 2000 to 2013, just in those three years, you had 71 um, women running, and most of them were in post-conflict countries. And I haven't looked at the numbers again since then, but that was, but you know, it gives you just a sense of how quickly these changes have taken place. And again, um, the importance of these post-conflict countries in terms of women running for a president. Um, okay, local government, same phenomena there. Um, you've had um, proportion, disproportionate numbers of women in countries like Ethiopia, Liberia, Burundi, Rwanda. No, sorry, I'm jumping, I'm jumping. Yeah, sorry, Namib just Namibia, just Namibia and Uganda and Mozambique. These would be examples of where you had 45% of the village councils headed by women. Um, so, then um, moving along to, to other areas, you see also in the, in the area of constitutional reform, and I've been working on this a bit more lately, um, where you see that the um, more, more of the provisions have been in the post-conflict countries, the provisions that have to do with women. In fact, up until recently, there were almost no provisions around women's rights. If the most you would ever see would be an equality clause, saying men and women are equal, equal under the Constitution. But now you see, and I've been, so at the time I did this orig original study, I didn't look at it longitudinally, but now I've done that. And the, the pattern is very clear that in the breaking the big change takes place after the year 2000, and that's when you begin to see the, the changes in the constitutions. So if you look pretty much every, under every category, the post-conflict countries do better, significantly better than the um, non-post-conflict countries, um, and especially um, in the areas of um, customary law, which is incredibly important in African constitutions. The provision there that, that's important is that um, the statutory law or the constitution overrides or overrules customary law if there's a conflict between the two. So again, this has enormous implications for women's rights um, and family law is usually the, the area that's the hardest to change and that when, where you have, see the most resistance. And so having that kind of provision is very, very important. It's no surprise that violence against women is an important um, provision that you see in the post-conflict countries given that the levels of violence against women go up. Um, property rights are incredibly vulnerable for women, for women and are very, very important um, because access to land is the key to access to, um, it's, it's your livelihood, um, and especially in a rural society where you live off the land and the land is your source of income and the source of your sustenance. So the, um, these are all, you know, these are all incredibly important. Citizenship of children is another area that you see, we're seeing more and more changes, especially in North Africa in recent years. That's where the citizenship of the children up until recently could only go through the man. Now it can go through either the man and the woman in 30% um, of the post-conflict countries versus only 8% of the countries without major conflict. So again, you know, the constitutional provisions are, I mean, these are very, very rough indicators, but they give you a sense of just, you know, what's changing. And then, no surprise, but the legislative changes then also that follow the Constitution um, are, are um, you know, the same pattern continues. And I've looked at this in, in several key areas having to do with land rights, but also um, when it comes to violence against women, you have exactly twice as many pieces of legislation around violence against women in the post-conflict countries compared to the um, non-post-conflict countries. So 
like I said, this is all tied to the decline of conflict. And I'm just going to make a little brief detour because maybe I don't know if people are really aware of this phenomenon, but you know, because you only hear in the headlines about Somalia and Boko Haram and Nigeria and so on. But overall, the, pa the pattern has been an, um, a decline globally as well as um, in Africa. So civil wars are the ones that are this large dotted area. And these, you have had this decline in civil war um, over in general. I mean, there's been... There's been, it's gone up and down, but it's, you can see the general trend has been down in numbers. And also you've had a, a, a large drop in the numbers of civil wars in Africa. So the same thing that you see in globally, you see really in Africa is it's a very pronounced drop. Um, blue, the blue line of the civil and the um, green line of the international conflicts. Um, what hasn't changed, and, and what you probably read in the papers a lot about, are the uh, refugees and internally displaced people. And that's still a problem, a huge problem, and it's a growing problem. And so you have large, large numbers of people, for example, in, um, that have fled from South Sudan, the conflict there, into Uganda. You still have ref internally displaced people in Somalia. Um, so that, that still is an issue, but in terms of the actual conflicts, these, these numbers are, have gone down. And also the intensity of conflicts has gone down and the duration of conflicts has gone down. So it's on you know, many fronts these changes have taken place. And the reasons have to do with the fact that there's been more focus on peace negotiations. Um, there's been much more, there have been many more international efforts. In the 80s you had almost no peacekeeping missions. After um, the 90s and especially 2000 you had more um, both re regional with ECOMOG in West Africa, but also um, international effort, UN efforts to um, and peacekeepers sent. You had more peace diplomacy, so when a conflict broke out, you would have Kofi Annan or Nelson Mandela or Julius Nyerere, or people would go in and leaders from other African countries. Um, the Botswana president has been more recently involved in these efforts. So when something breaks out, then the neighboring countries jump in and try to stop it and, and, keep, and nip it in the bud. There's been much more of that. Um, Libya, <laughs> Gaddafi signed an agreement in 2006 to stop mucking around in Africa and, and involvement in terrorist activities. And so after 2006, we saw a decline um, in Libya's involvement. And Libya had been involved in most, almost every co conflict in Africa up until that point in a, in a you know, concerted way. And then finally, you've had uh, pressure from peace movements and women's movements, which I talk about in the book. And these are not covered in the New York Times, they're not covered in the major media, but they are, they've been a part of these efforts, um, as well as efforts by various peace-related NGOs that are, do a lot of behind-the-scenes activities. Okay, so that, that's just, it was a little bit of a detour, but then going back to our, our story here about what happened. So, um, so what you had was um, a, a series of what we call in political science or sociology opportunity structures. So at the end, of, so what happened at the end at the end of conflict is you have uh, peace negotiations and you have peace agreements that are signed, often a big comprehensive peace agreement, and then you have um, constitutions that are rewritten that that follow from those peace agreements. You have electoral commissions that are formed, and often these um, have. Um, uh, they're often headed up by women or they have um, input from women's organizations. And then also truth and reconciliation commissions which kind of bring to light some of the atrocities during the conflict and, and you know, highlight the perpetrators and, and, and let people air their grievances. So these are all kind of mechanisms through which uh, women's rights get articulated. Um, perhaps the most, um, the one where you've seen, seen the most visible role of women is in the constitutional making process. And here you have women who've been involved, you know, very, very active in the, con the constitutional commissions that are writing the constitution. So this is Miriam Matembe, who was one of two people who, there were two women lawyers that were on the constitutional commission. And I mean, their views were taken very, very seriously and um, they were incorporated into the constitution. They did, they worked um, with civil society very actively, they did uh, uh, seminars throughout the country, got views of women's organizations. 26,000 memos were sent in by women's organizations. That was more than from any other sector of society um, to, to influence the constitution-making process. 
And then they also were, Matembe in particular was also on the constituent assembly, and so one third of the seats on the constituent assembly were also of women. And so they had many moments where they could insert themselves into the process. Um, you have now this ongoing process in Liberia. It got stalled by the Ebola crisis, but it's going on. And so Gloria Scott, who was the, she'd been the head of the Supreme Court, she now has been heading up the Constitutional um, Review Committee of Liberia. Um, the peace agreements have been much harder for women to assert themselves, but they've tried. I mean, they've lobbied them. They've been observers. Uh, only 9% of the people who've sat in on the meetings have been women um, who have been actual signatories to the peace agreements. But um, 32 peace of the peace agreements include women's rights provisions in Africa. And of the comprehensive peace agreements, that's the final product, 62% of them have got some women's rights language. This is much higher than other parts of the world. Um, it, what you find in Africa is much, it's much more extensive. Um, but anyway, these are, the, these are the, the kind of opportunities that women then took advantage of to move their agendas ahead. So, going back to our, our argument, our question, what accounts for these changes? Um, here, I think there's the, these three things going on, at least, at least three things. One is that you had this disruption in gender um, roles and, and gender relations as well. Um, if you look at um, pretty much in, in Uganda, for example, where I've been looking at this for the longest period of time, the, um, you, you just see very, very profound changes in society. If you, and I've been going there pretty much every year, and so I've been able to watch this, this you know, going on for a long period of time. But, you know, during the war, women started doing all kinds of things that they hadn't done before. They started driving cars. They, they, they took over their households. They started be taking on occupations they had never taken on before, becoming brickmakers, becoming um, carpenters, uh, and, and doing, you know, doing all kinds of businesses. And now today you see women in all kinds of, not just little businesses now, but major businesses like this Alice um, Karugaba, who won an award from the Uganda Business Association for being, you know, for her entrepreneurship. Um, and she started out, you know, just selling small breakfast pastries and having a few bicycle men on bicycles delivering them and had a small grocery shop and now she runs this big um, enter Nina Interiors furniture store. You have um, women in education, ch major changes in this field. Um, the gap is almost completely closed between boys and girls in terms of primary and secondary education. Um, and uh, in primary school, it's actually exceeded. So you have about 102% of the students are, um, are, are girls in primary school. And the numbers have tripled at the, at the tertiary level. Um, when I first went to Uganda in the early 90s, they had a 1.5% um, affirmative action program to allow women to um, give them an added leg up with qualified women, women who are qualified, um, a kind of affirmative action program to get them into the university. And they also um, provided them with bursaries, with, with uh, fellowships. And today, women are doing, the, the top students are almost every year are women. <laughs> so, you know, the whole situation has just changed very, very dramatically. You've, when I first went to Uganda, there, were only, there was only one woman um, race car driver. Now there's like so many I can't even count them. Um, but we were, women are getting into um, netball, football, all kinds of sports, mechanics, you know, doing things that they never would have even thought of. And, and that's, that, that's, I think, that perhaps more than anything, that's what changed. And it's not something you can really put your finger on. It's not palpable in that way. But I think what changed the most was just pe women's um, idea of what they could do, and their imagination expanded, and their, their idea of what was doable and thinkable uh, expanded. And so women felt that they could just, you know, if I want to be a, if I want to be a um, chancellor, a vice chancellor of a university, I can do that. If I want to run a big business, I can do that. If I want to be, you know, become um, active, uh, elite, and if I want to become, you know, a, a judge, you can do that. And so that, that, that idea of what was thinkable really is expanded. Um, women got into, you know, in, in Algeria, I've been working more recently in North Africa. In Algeria, there's four women um, generals now. And uh, that's the highest in the Middle East, but it's also uh, the highest, and it's highest in Africa. But it's also, you know, more than in, in Germany, for example, there's only one woman um, uh, uh, general.
Um, and even Algeria, where you've had the additional, some of the additional um, challenges coming from the extreme, uh, from Islamists, you, you have women getting into new fields that they hadn't got into before, like becoming um, Muslim scholars and driving buses and so on. Okay, so disrupting gender relations. Um, then you have the, the role of the women's movement. And again, none of, none of this would have happened if there hadn't been pressure, somebody pushing for change to take place. And so you have these expansion of women's movements that often took advantage of the fact that there was peace and that there was sometimes greater political space, even if it was limited. Um, and then you have the changes in international norms. And these, and these norms, like I said, came from a lot from the UN. Um, pressures for countries to um, make these kinds of changes in leadership. Um, in the Southern Africa, the Southern African Development Community has been very active in pushing governments to um, increase leadership. Um, I mentioned the UN conference in 1995. Um, so, you know, these are all, um, all uh, sources of, of pressure on governments themselves, not from below, but from above. And then finally, um, so just to kind of sum up where, you know, where, we've, where we've taken this, um, my, my argument in a nutshell has to do with that this, can be this phenomenon can be explained by disruptions in gender relations and norms during the, conf during the conflict, um, the push from below from women's movements, and then the push, the pressures on governments by um, international actors, by UN, by SADC, by the African Union also, the Maputo Protocol. Um, around women's rights, all of these have put pressure on governments themselves to take action. So this leaves us with lots of questions, <laughs> I think. Um, and I spent a whole chapter outlining a lot of these questions. And in fact, if you're looking for a paper topic or for a dissertation topic, the last chapter of my book has got lots of ideas for them. So one question that I have is that if conflict disrupts gender relations, does it also disrupt other social relations? So for example, the disability movement in, in many countries, Uganda, Angola, has become quite active in recent years um, because of the large numbers of people who've been, um, who suffered from serious inju injuries. Um, and it's also begun to challenge some of the ideas that people have about the sources of um, inju injury and um, uh, illness. Uh, that's, a, that's another discussion, but it, it goes into um, sorcery. Um, okay, another question I have is that while women's roles expanded after conflict and women were better positioned to demand further rights, it's less clear to what extent did women, the men's roles change? Did men take on new roles? Did they, um, did they take on more of, of the care work that women did? Um, did women continue to remain subordinate to men in the household even when their roles expanded in, in other areas? Um, so these are all, you know, and, and, it, and also one of the things that many studies have pointed out and what I also saw myself firsthand was that men didn't often have the same resilience in coping with some of the, conf the, the, um, the challenges of conflict and so they were not as resilient as women. And this is not a surprise. I mean, if you look at some of the literature on other wars, like World War I, for example, you see these same patterns. So how do, you think, how do we think of these negative byproducts of major, major social d disruption? Are they inevitable, or can they be ameliorated with greater attentiveness? I mean, what do we make of this? And then um, the nature of conflict is changing in Africa as well. It's not, um, you know, we don't have these big long, these big wars where you have large number of casualties. We don't have long wars anymore. We have more the activities of Al-Shabaab in Somalia. We have um, Ansar Din in Mali, Al-Qaeda, Akim in Algeria and Mali. You know, these, these groups, and, and, and the disruption is, you know, 17 people killed here, 11 people there. It's not, it's low-grade warfare. What does that mean? It doesn't, you know, it doesn't fit these other patterns. So what does that mean for women? Does it have any impact on women's rights? And does that have the same um, it doesn't have the same consequence, but what, you know, what is the, yeah, what, what impact, what are the consequences for women of, for that, of that, that kind of violence? Are they the same as what I've been describing? So I will stop there and I will be glad to entertain your questions. Thank you.
Okay, Keith. <laughs> oh, I should get a pen. About what? And, uh, about counting the seats. Counting, the okay. Um, so, in the back of my mind here is the work that Martha Johnson's done with Leo Areola. Leo Areola. Mm -hmm. and, um, one of the posts that were in it, and that was in it, was that shows that women are often allocated lower prestige in history of the Sure. Or otherwise, ones that are sort of traditionally associated with gender roles, like, you know, the Ministry of Religion or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and is there, so I'm wondering, is there any variation? Right. Um, I haven't actually done the the. Uh, I haven't counted that out. It's it would be a whole project in itself. But but it, but it, but I mean the countries that I've looked at, I've, it's definitely true. So Uganda, which was the first one, you had the woman vice president, you had the minister of agriculture. These are the key positions in African. It's not in the U.S. cabinet, but in the African cabinet, the main ones. You had a minister of agriculture at the time. You've had um, minister of industries. You've had. Um, so there were, I'm trying to remember all of them. There were, there were quite a, a few at the time. If you'd asked me this 10 years ago, I could have rattled them off. Li Liberia is a more recent one, where I, so I remember these better. Um, you've had Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, Finance, um, Defense. Um, all the top positions um, have been held by women in, in the Liberian cabinet. Not all at the same time, but you know, over, over time. Um, the last cabinet chief Ellen Johnson surely formed was, did not have so many women in the top positions. But I've been you know, noticing this, and so you, I, you, you, do, you have seen these. Um, uh, just, okay, I'm just saying, just anecdotally it looks to me like you see more, but I haven't yet been counted it, so I, don't, I can't tell you for sure. Um, but that was one of the changes that took place. I mean, that was that you saw women in more of the heftier um, uh, ministries. The other question that one has to ask in relation to that is, well, what is, you know, what people often talk about these ministries as being so important, but, you know, what's wrong with education and health? I mean, why aren't those equally important? I mean, they are not considered, you know, usually as central as finance and, and foreign affairs or defense, but, you know, it's a question of also how you characterize them and how you think about what's important and what's um, meaningful. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Kristen Hyrule. So okay, I'm yeah. Later, so okay. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really informative and uh, thought provoking. And I just wanted to follow up on um, the question of the women's movement and, in particular, um, to what degree they're mobilized through local resources and networks versus the international women's movement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because it might be that. In, in these post-conflict arenas, I don't know if the, those arenas are increasingly attracting attention from the global women's movement. Maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe they've all read your book and they're like, oh, <laughs> you know, this yeah. is the time of when we, we jump in. So to what extent are those movements that are arising around this time mm -hmm. sort of lo a locally processed uh, movement or international, or it's, I'm sure it's a combination. Right, it's a it's a combination of both. They definitely some of the larger ones definitely get their money from abroad. Um, even in the wartime, they did. Um, but you know, a lot of the there's so much that you don't hear about. I mean, if you, like if you went to Nimba, for example, which was a center of the conf, one of the centers of conflict in Liberia, it was just local women's groups that would get up in the morning and sweep the streets and clean the garbage. Nobody is there. Nobody paying them, nobody, you know, just doing it. No, no awards for them, no recognition for them, nobody will ever know. You know, it's just, but they did it just to, because they had to keep society going and there was no one to, else to do it and the state was, it collapsed. So there's a lot of this kind of activity that just doesn't get accounted for, but certainly the larger NGOs were getting funding from abroad for sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can... I can tell you who they're getting funding from, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, well, <laughs> I can tell you later where they got the funding from. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I'll be seeing you um, at your tomorrow's talk. Okay, well. good. Good. Um, 
then, unlike the World War II um, parallel, that, parallel that you drew, where... World War I. Oh, sorry. Not, one, yeah, not World War II, yeah. Um, there, so there were women's movements like prior to mm -hmm. the war. Yes. There were always demands for women's rights and right. rights. But it was that after the war, um, these movements gained momentum. Right. So, so is that like different from this case where... Um, after the war, it wasn't that just the pre-existing movements gained power, but that there was like more international uh, women's movements and funding. Is, is that like a difference between the two cases? Um, I'm not quite. I'm not. I'm sure if I followed your your oh, question okay, in exactly. Yeah, yes. so, um, so compared to the world, World War One, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I said okay. Yeah, they were the same movements in, in both cases. I mean, they were the and the different. I mean, what happened in World War One was that these women could, you know, have been pushing and pushing and pushing for women, you know, for the right to vote. Nothing, nothing happened at all. And then finally, you know, it was only after World War One that, because of the role of women in the war, that they then were able to, you know, make their make their claims, get their claims heard, and and they they were recognized. Um, and and um, and so this exactly the same thing happened. I mean, these were the same movements that then continued. Um, but certainly after the war, it was even easier to organize and mobilize in many countries. And so you had, um, um, you know, expansion of some, and others others died away. Um, and then, you know, I mean, the, all movements kind of have this arc. They don't go on forever. <laughs> you know, the momentum kind of dies down. And so. You know, gradually, um, let's say by 2012 or so, things had kind of, in Liberia had, you know, 2006 would have been the peak of the movement right after the conflict. So the two years after the conflict, that was the peak, and then it started. If you look at the coverage of the movement in the newspapers, it starts going down after that. So you know, it, it, these have a natural life to them. To them, but then different kinds of organizations emerge that start dealing with different issues. So in the war, it's very hard to deal with education policy, for example, <laughs> in the middle of the war. But after that, YWCA, that YWCA got very active, and and other organizations around around issues of, in Liberia, of education for women, that became a priority, um, and literacy for older women. Um, the same thing with market women. In the, during the war, they were just busy trying to survive and keeping the cities fed. After the war, these organizations got more organized and got more funding and, and, and started fixing up the, the marketplace and getting shelter and getting toilets and childcare and other things. So, you know, the, the kinds of organizations also changed after the, after the war. And in, the, in, say, the U.S. or Germany or um, U.K., there was no re need anymore to have the organizations to push for the right to vote. <laughs> so in, you know, those went away, obviously, but then other kinds of organizations emerged. And there was kind of a lull between the wars in terms of mobilization. Yeah. Right. Forgiving women rights. Of course. Like that. Yeah. So I was just wondering, like, do you have any insight as to, like, moving on in the future, like, in terms of avoiding wars, ways in which women can increase their representation in Africa, or have you observed any examples of, like, just in general, women increasing their representation without the need for, like, a mass conflict? Right. So yeah, I mean, and there's many routes to it. The Nordic route was another one. It wasn't the fast track route that Rwanda took, but it was a, you know, it was another route. It took a hundred years, and you know, on the rate that we're going, it'll be 50 more years until we have parity in the U.S. If, we, if we're willing to wait that long. Um, and uh, so one of the ways that countries are doing it is the same way that these non these post these post conflict countries have done it, and that's adopting quotas. So Cameroon, for example, had, had very low rates of representation, and they went then from I forget if it was like five some five or six percent to thirty five percent again overnight <laughs> without a conflict, but following the same pattern as the other countries. So there was a kind of a political learning that went on, and that happened recently. So you know that these Senegal did the same thing; they had a big um, campaign by women's organizations and pushed for it and took advantage of the President Wad's um, statement that you know he's, he was going to encourage women to get into politics and they said yes let's go for it and 
but then you know took advantage of a moment of a, of a, a moment of transition and a campaign promise and took advantage of that to then get um, women's get the quota passed so there are plenty of other mechanisms to do it it's just you know these just happen to be very quick ones <laughs> and dramatic ones um, that we've seen but certainly there's others and I'm kind of tra tracking that right now in you know in the North Africa and looking at some of the changes there that are taking place without you know, without conflict. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. It, it's it's an infuriating answer, and in fact, w the person who's responsible, I, I I think, is we're giving an, a getting her. I'm giving her. I got her an honorary doctorate at UW, <laughs> so I don't know why we did that. But anyway, it's Linda Thomas Greenfield was the was the U.S. ambassador to Liberia. She was one of our former students from UW, and I and I did. You know, I've given her grief over it. She made the statement at a very critical moment when they were going over through the Constitution, of you know. <laughs> Should they should they should they um, go for the quota? And she just said, "Well, in the U.S., we don't have one," <laughs> and and said that you know women should just be you know smarter and, and figure out other ways to do it. They don't need to rely on these kinds of mechanisms. So, which is you know it's a reasonable argument, except that it's just it's very very hard in extremely patriarchal societies to you know and even ones that aren't you know it's very it's hard. So, um, and then um, Helen Johnson Sirleaf really herself didn't support it. And I interviewed lots of parliamentarians and the women, but they, you know, they, that became the whole thing. We don't need it. We're strong enough. We've, we've, we've been able to get this far without it. We have a woman president. Look, we can do it on our own. And they can't. So that's why. And then the other thing was, and now they are. So now with this current constitution, they are, they are going to push. They're, they're trying to push. It's, it's, in the, it's in the current one. But it, it took them a long time, and they got really uh, nailed by a lot of countries who were saying, what's wrong with you? You're so far behind on this. And they, you know, they finally realized that it wasn't going to happen any other way. So at least it would take, a, you know, 100 years to get there. So they are changing it now, but they have to now get this new constitution passed. Yeah. But um, I, I thought that would be really interesting to know about because we also have this pattern, at least that um, during the slave trade, there was this change in sex ratio and there was expansion of women's roles, but then people also talk at length about how that sometimes reinforced a patriarchy, you know, whereby older men sort of had a lot more power over women and younger men because of the dearth of, uh, of young men mm -hmm. who, were, who were being sold. Mm. Um, so I, I don't know if, if that pattern ever disrupted sort of the patriarchy and sort of local maybe village institutions um, or maybe, you know, in, in sort of ethnic groups in terms of how, you know, whether women, let's say, were more able to serve on village councils mm -hmm. or in groups of elders mm -hmm. um, as a result of sort of maybe the slave trade or pre-colonial warfare. I have no idea. <laughs> That's really stretching it. For me anyway, I would not be able to, to have any way of saying anything. Um, okay. Yeah, I, it's because that was before this, these modern states, and so I don't know how that would have factored in. Um, but, you know, I think looking at all of these issues at the local level would be very interesting, and, and looking at the dynamics. I mean, I was just really struck in Liberia. Everywhere I went, it was like almost like a mantra. You, people would say, well, I said, what, is, what changed with the conflict at the local, you know, in your community? And they said that the biggest change was that well, I mean, men and women both said it, that in the past, whenever they had the palaver, or the, the meeting of everybody, you know, under the, like the Baraza in Tanzania or the Kotla in, in um, Botswana, they, they would, um, women were always in the back, men were in the front, men did all the talking, women didn't talk.
And now the difference is women do all the talking, women run these things, <laughs> these community discussions, and men are in the back, and that's not the new problem, is men are in the back, women are in the front, and so that they, haven't, they have to now find another medi happy medium. Um, but that was the... <laughs> So, but, but those dynamics, I think, are really interesting, and I don't know that they, I don't know if they follow these national patterns in the same way. But you know, I could I, I saw it. I've seen it in different places. In Uganda, I saw it as well. Um, and in Uganda, I did something different. I didn't just look at the formal politics. I looked at local level conflicts around access to resources that had and how they used different institutions like the church, like the local councils, like the. Um, traditional authorities and how they use them in these and, and, and that was the big change there in the early 90s was that they had never seen conflicts like this where women were act, act saying we want, a, we want a local, uh, a, um, to control a local clinic for health because we, are, you know, we can't get to the hospital to deliver our babies we need to have them here locally women were demanding market space women were demanding um, uh, control of the school local PTAs and so on. So there was all, you know, all kinds of, um, these kinds of struggles were new. They had never had them on the scale, so many of them, and women really just asserting themselves at the local level. Now, I don't know. I mean, I can give you stories from different countries. I don't know if it's a, this is a pattern there, but, you know, obviously there's, you know, there's something there as well happening. Yeah. Um, my name is Jaco Hammond, and I teach in religion, psychology, and culture here in Lenin. Okay. Uh, a question about the countries you mentioned, I couldn't help but notice they were all countries where the parity gap between rich and poor mm -hmm. are extremely, I mean, the biggest in the world, on right. the Gini ratio. Right. And so I'm wondering if class is replacing more in terms of bringing equality for, for women, maybe, or women into leadership. Uh -huh. so Botswana did not have a major conflict, but they are high up on the list. Namibia didn't have, they're high up on the list. But those countries also are the countries where the gap between rich and poor are the biggest. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's a way um, that the, the parity gap of income also plays a role in countries that may not have significant conflict. So they don't have, so you're not asking about gender, you're just asking about the conflict between whether or not they had conflicts, and and if they had a conflict, that they, that they, the conflicts were in countries where there was not a big so, so gap. So like Namibia that also has a high ratio of women in leadership. Yeah. But I never had a, a civil big war or something like that. They yeah. Didn't have that major major conflict. But well, they had a war of liberation. They had a war of you know they had a war with with Swapo against South Africa. They had a war. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, that, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, Angola is a country that one of these countries, and it has the, perhaps the biggest gap in, of, um, in terms of equality in inequality in in Africa. But again, I don't, I don't, I can't. That would be something else to research. I just, I didn't look at that particular question. I'm sorry to say, um, but no doubt inequality plays into this somehow. There's, there's no question about it. It has to. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I hate to ask a question that might sound like something like, where are the men at in this story? So let me say this a little bit differently. Um, I'm thinking about the sort of political strategy behind this. I know mm -hmm. like, some of the arguments about suffrage expansion was about the alignment between parties and parties being strategically to seek out female voters and what sort of list of prospects. I'm kind of wondering if this story is one of um, a particular post-conflict environment where generals change and women have better bargaining power, mm -hmm. uh, as well as there being sort of uh, movements, uh, both sort of, being, again, sort of domestic and international, to influence their ability to change institutions. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking like, is, is there, on the other side of this table, sort of the, the incumbent political leaders who have not been men in the past, like what is their strategy um, in this role? So I'm thinking about like generals and somewhere like Tanzania, I know that they boost disproportionality and give you see more control over perhaps um, the behavior of female legislators. Maybe that's a strategic move that can boost their advantage. So that, does that question make sense? So I'm wondering if there's like a, what is the role of incumbents who are also at the bargaining table when they're putting these laws in place? Right. And is it a political strategy or simply that they are, that it, it is purely a story of uh, a changed bargaining? No, it, that's what, that's, that gets at exactly what's, why, so why these conflicts make this easier, is because this, the old order is out. Charles Taylor's out of the picture. You know, people, the old leaders are, in general, um, 
Every, all the rules are, are rewritten. Electoral rules are usually rewritten after a conflict. The, the players are, are usually, you know, new, new people. I mean, there's some, there are some old people that somehow then get re-elected, but everything gets started from scratch. And so um, the people who came in, for example, in Uganda in 19... Um, 87 into the new parliament were completely different, at least initially. <laughs> it, it changed as time went on, but from the people who had been there in the past. And so, and it was a compl under a whole new arrangement and a whole new set of rules. And, and uh, then after the constitution got rewritten, it was completely, again, completely different. So that's why I think that you have, you know, if it's just a, otherwise when you introduce like a quota system in general, th there's, a, there's a sense that, that if women win, men lose. And so there's no incentive to support that. And that's why often it's very hard. But when you have this kind of a disrupture, disrupture and, and rewriting of the rules, it makes it easier then to um, start afresh. And um, you don't have the same folks from the past um, constraining change, if that makes sense. Yeah. But you know, now as, as, as I was saying it, I'm like think qualifying, thinking of, you know, I can think of all kinds of old actors from the past that then came back into Parliament. But the point is that the arrangement was different, and that they didn't, they were not the ones making the rules anymore. So I think that was what was different. They might have come in, but not. Um, and some of the people were really problematic. Um, you know, Prince Johnson, who was just one of the most heinous warlords in Liberia, came into the new parliament, sitting next to some, and had to sit next to a woman that I interviewed who said that her husband had been killed by him, his people. You know, <laughs> that kind of a situation. <laughs> so it's it can be nasty. Yeah. In Liberia. Mm -hmm. um, to some extent, um, my question is piggybacking on the previous. Question. Yeah. What role, I noticed that the women you put up, mm -hmm. a lot of them are American, descendants of American Sure, period. sure. What did that, how did that play yeah. in terms of who actually went into Parliament uh -huh. uh, between the American Liberians right. and the indigenous uh, right. people that created so much conflict? Exactly. Uh, uh, which took, cla I, I, took class forms right. uh, in the country. Right, uh, right. And I'm, I'm curious about that. Yeah. No, and a lot of the women, I mean, to this day, that's, that's the case because that's, I mean, for all these positions, it was the, the big problem was to find people who were qualified to take over in a country that hadn't had education system, a functioning system for, for forever, and to find people who had, you know, who, who the, the worry was that they would also, you know, take advantage of the situation for corrupt purposes of corruption. So it was very difficult to find people, and they went with people. Um, so yes, a large percentage, you're absolutely right, I, I'd say the majority were um, uh, what they call um, co the Congo, the people, the, the people who were of um, African American descent originally. Um, but that's the, and, that, and in most countries, you know, the most of the people who are in parliament are the elite. They're not, in every country, they're, the, they're better educated, they're usually, um, they're not going to be grassroots people. It's just, that's just the way it is in every African country and every country in the world. <laughs> Um, African African countries are no different that way, but in, it did take that that um, um, that was a factor in 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 who ended up as ministers and who ended up in parliament as well. And one more question: mm -hmm. you, you had South Africa in one of the lists uh -huh. in terms of percentages. Yeah. But how does South Africa differ uh -huh. from uh, the countries in Southern Africa that you're talking? Right. Well, it's West Africa. Uh -huh. I raise it because my two visits to South Africa in the last four years, uh -huh. there's a, a, still a lot of tension, a, a growing number of very well educated women. Sure. Uh, I taught the uh, summer course at a, a UNISA, mm -hmm. and the dean there is a woman. Right. And we talked about that, but what, much of the conflict in the classes around gender mm -hmm. uh, was extremely heated. Mm -hmm, intense. Mm -hmm. And I discovered later that a lot of this, uh, these were graduate students and um, newly meant PhDs. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, when I talked to them privately, they also talked about the tension between those who were living in the urban areas of what is opposed to those who are mm -hmm, also living mm -hmm. in the villages. Right. And have to deal with the issues of the chiefs in the village. Exactly. Um, I, I can understand not having that in the discussion. Right. South Africa is a new case. Right. But it seems to me 
uh, I learned, especially right. the second visit, how intense the gender issues are. Uh -huh. And when I heard recently that Zumba had been taken out, yeah. I jumped for joy because uh -huh. talking to the women, right. uh, he was horrible. Of course. And there's been this succession right. of uh, the ANC has such a control over sure. what goes on. Sure. How do women rise higher mm -hmm. in that system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's that. You mentioned many different things. I, I think maybe I just talk about the traditional authorities because that's perhaps one of the areas that are the most is one of the most contentious. Um, and they, for them, it's you know, it, it in South Africa as well as elsewhere in Africa. I mean, they they they're, they're really trying to become a political force in South Africa more so than even in the past. Um, and but you know, they're they're in in, in many other parts of Africa as well, and um, in many countries, especially where you saw state collapse. For other, not not South Africa, but other countries where you saw state collapse, these authorities became more important. So you know, in, so that's why it is the case that in especially in these post-conflict countries, they have these provisions in the constitution that allow for statutory law or allow for the constitution to override um, the authority of traditional authorities. But that's on paper. The reality, like you said, is completely different. And when you go to the rural areas, that that is the reality that, that they confront. And how land gets allocated. You know, all of these issues are so much contingent on those authorities and or the clan authorities if you're in Uganda or somewhere else. And so, you know, the, what I've been describing is, you know, perhaps in many ways a very surface kind of a change um, and that much of the real change has to go, you know, take place has in a, at a much deeper level within society, within the rural areas, within areas where you have these traditional structures that are, that, that impede women's ability to realize their rights. Um, and so, you know, that's the that's perhaps an, a question that I mean, I think it's more of a question that that requires further research to understand. You know, what? So, so okay, fine. You have all these norms. You have these changes at the, at this level. But does it actually trickle down, and does it have an impact in people's lives? You know, and there the answer is is very. I can give you examples of where it has made changes, and, and other where it really hasn't, and where it hasn't taken effect. So. Um, I think it's an I think it's a question mark and not um, I can't answer the you know for all all about all 52 countries and <laughs> um, but yeah and I recognize it yeah in a particular case yeah but yeah but it is, there's some aspects of it that are that that um, resonate in other countries as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the fourth time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Oh.